This is Haven Street, a small and otherwise unremarkable village on the Isle of Wight. But many visitors will make a special journey here each year to enjoy the delights of the Isle of Wight Steam Railway. This is the railway's headquarters, and since 1966 work has been ongoing to preserve a steam service covering just over five miles that not only recreates a bygone era of gracious travel, but also introduces those too young to have experienced the power of steam to the real thing. All ages will find something special at Haven Street. New generations of steam enthusiasts, often inspired by the delightful tales of the Reverend Audrey, are able to actually see trains that look like Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends in action, with more mature visitors nostalgically recalling the sights, sounds and smells of yesteryear, when today's adventure was just an everyday means of transport. But before we take a closer look at this wonderful steam railway and follow its journey the length of the line, it's well worth investigating briefly the history of the island's once extensive railway network that in its heyday boasted over 55 miles of track. For most people, the Isle of Wight is strongly associated with Queen Victoria, whose country retreat, Osborne House, is open to the public today. The royal family enjoyed many summers here, and of course where Queen Victoria and Prince Albert led, the rest of society followed, and the Isle of Wight quickly became a popular destination. As the great new railway age dawned, an initial stretch of line opened from Cowes to Newport in 1862. It was the year after Prince Albert died, and Osborne had become Queen Victoria's favourite royal residence, bringing many distinguished guests to the island, and it was here that she died in 1901. Railway progress was rapid, with the Isle of Wight Railway Company opening the ride to Shanklin Line in 1866, which was later linked with Newport and Cowes. Since 1814, Ride had been in possession of a superb half-mile-long pier for ferry passengers, and when the railway arrived, travel around the island improved significantly. By the turn of the century, all lines were completed, with regular services linking Bembridge, Sandown, Ventnor and Freshwater to the major towns of Ryde, Cowes, Newport and Shanklin. With Freshwater on the railway map, out on the west coast, access was improved to the world-famous Needles Headland and Alum Bay. This is how the railways on the Isle of Wight remained for some considerable time, with a number of different companies running the operations. The seasonal nature of the business caused many problems and economical viability was never easy. In summer months they needed to accommodate thousands of visitors, but in winter months trains lay idle. 
Things, however, did improve when in 1923 all the railway companies were grouped together as part of Southern Railways, which continued through until nationalisation in 1948. It's hard to believe, looking at Ride Pier today, that in the 1930s, on summer Saturdays, 36,000 passengers would pass through the station with a train leaving every 10 minutes. Maintaining rolling stock for such a short but frantic season must have been a logistic nightmare. But worse was to come, as the number of family cars increased and holiday makers used the trains less, making sufficient profit through the summer months to run the network through the rest of the year became more and more difficult. Inevitably, there were significant closures of unviable lines, and this was happening long before the much maligned Dr Beeching turned his attention to the Isle of Wight. As we've already seen, today's visitors can travel in style under steam power on the section of track preserved by the Isle of Wight Steam Railway between Wootton and Smallbrook Junction. But there's also an island line still in operation between Ryde and Shanklin. If people are unaware of the history of the Isle of Wight train services, it can come as a bit of a surprise when a London underground train pulls up to take them to their destination. For over a century, the Isle of Wight Railways operated a fleet of antiquated tank engines and outdated carriages, acquired second-hand from a wide variety of mainland railway companies. And when steam ceased in 1966, surplus London underground stock seemed a good alternative and the eight-and-a-half-mile section from Ryde to Shanklin that remains in use today was electrified. It's a pleasant journey, and although perhaps not as nostalgic as the steam railway, the underground trains have a charm all their own, delivering passengers to the resorts of Sandown and Shanklin, which will always be popular destinations. The Island Line also has enviable official recognition as Britain's most punctual and reliable rail service. The lack of a train service through to the charming and sheltered holiday resort of Ventnor is a sad loss. This extra stretch of line used to take passengers through the 1200 metre Ventnor Tunnel, which is now boarded up and overgrown. This was considered to be too costly to maintain, and in 1966 the magnificent arrival into Ventnor through the dramatic cliff face ceased to be. Back to Haven Street, 
which got its name from the time when Wooten Creek was extended further inland, indeed making this village a haven. The dictionary definition of haven is a place of safety, and for the future of steam travel on the Isle of Wight, the name is still equally as appropriate today. The atmosphere is evocative of an age long past, and visitors are treated to a delightful bygone scene. Haven Street Station is unusual in more ways than one, but the most noticeable feature is the building not being at platform level. This happened when it was rebuilt in 1926, following the installation of a passing loop. The other buildings, including a souvenir shop, Granny Winter's Pantry, and museum have all been built or restored in keeping with this style. The maintenance depot is also here and there's a remarkable selection of engines and carriages. Early morning and steam is already rising. Today, Calbourne will be in service for a busy half-term holiday, six train schedule. This LSWR Class 02 locomotive, built in 1891 at Nine Elms, has a very special place in the heart of the IWSR, because she was the very first acquisition of the original White Locomotive Society back in 1967, for the princely sum of £900. Remarkably, Ken, her driver today, worked on Calbourne while she was in mainline service. Senior drivers were assigned to a specific engine and Ken and Calbourne were only parted when the main line was electrified in 1966. He knows every nook and cranny of this magnificent locomotive and his delight at being reunited with his old friend is evident as he goes about his well-practiced duties. The only difference being that nowadays he does so as a volunteer. Calbourne arrived on the Isle of Wight on the 26th of April 1925, renumbered W24, and was a much needed addition to the understocked island's motive power. Decked out in the colours of southern railways, exactly as you see her today, Calbourne operated in such splendour until nationalisation brought the black livery and BR crest of British Railways. With the end of steam traction on 31st of December 1966, Calbourne and sister engine W31 Chail were retained as electrification works trains before withdrawal from service and in Calbourne's case, purchase for preservation. Here are the great lady's vital statistics. Calbourne is a class 02 044T, weighing 48 tonnes, 800 weight. Cylinders are 18 inches by 24, and the boiler pressure is 160 pounds to the square inch. Driving wheels are 4 foot 10, and her former number before coming to the Isle of Wight was LSWR 209. Hours later and preparations are complete. Today a trainee fireman is being put through his paces and it's time to get Calbourne connected up for the first journey of the day, 
under Ken, the driver's watchful and very experienced gaze. The first visitors have also started to arrive and the pressure is on. Not bad for a beginner, but the wise old words about practice making perfect spring to mind. The Isle of Wight Steam Railway is a great place for youngsters who've never experienced steam as a working transport system to actually learn the skills required. To become a steam engine driver from scratch takes a great deal of dedication and the process can start at the age of 16 by joining as a cleaner. But it'll take at least two years to swap an oily rag for the much-prized fireman's shovel. An intensive period of training will then follow, often taking years, leading to examinations and the eventual proud passing out of a fully qualified driver. Great to know that the age-old dream of becoming an engine driver is alive and well safely preserved as part of this very special steam railway. Haven Street is actually located in the middle of the IWSR line. The reason for this is the fact that at the outset trains were operated between Wooten and Haven Street, covering about two miles of track. As the steam society developed, opportunities arose to extend eastwards towards Smallbrook Junction to form an interchange with the then Network Southeast Island Line running between Ryde and Shanklin. This three and a half mile extension has proved to be extremely popular and of course trains today run to both the east and the west from Haven Street. For the purposes of this programme, we'll be taking the journey from Smallbrook Junction to Wootton, stopping along the way to take a look at places of interest. We've chosen to take you in this direction because Calborn will be operating Smokebox first. This means that she can be viewed front on. The traditional image that you would expect to see of a steam locomotive. However, she does function equally as effectively bunker or tender first. On this line, locomotives run bunker first from Wooten to Smallbrook and smoke box first from Smallbrook to Wooten. This is a single track line and there is no turntable, so it's impossible to turn the engine without literally lifting it off the tracks. As a result, at either end of the line, the engine is uncoupled and runs around the carriages to change direction. It's great fun to watch, and the visitors thoroughly enjoy the manoeuvre. Smallbrook Junction can't actually be reached by road or even footpath. The only entry point is by train, either the Island Line Electric Service or the IWSR. Although this interchange station didn't come into being until the 20th of July 1991, there was always a junction here where the ride to Ventnor and ride to Newport lines diverged, which in times long past was rather isolated for the solitary signalman. Not that this was ever an issue during the busy summer months during the heyday of rail travel, the signalman had little time to do anything but see the island's frequently arriving and departing trains safely on their way. During winter months, when there was little traffic, the signal box was switched out, with the up and down lines to ride operated as two parallel single tracks. The signal box here today is not the original but it was brought in from Dean Farm Crossing at Whitwell, which was the only level crossing on the Merstone to Ventnor West Line, which closed in the 1950s. After passengers from the Island Line have boarded, 
all is set for the journey to begin. Because the IWSR service runs a scenic journey rather than merely a functional transport system, trains are less frequent. With visitors timetabled in from as far afield as Portsmouth, the steam service will always wait for the colourful London underground trains of the Island Line to arrive. This is one place, beautiful as the countryside might be, that you don't want to miss your connection. An hour until the next train is a long time to wait. Once the guard has blown his whistle and lowered his flag, it's full steam ahead for Haven Street. The bridges are surprisingly narrow on the line, and there's a very good reason for this. When James Brindley was building canals some years before the railways came into being, he devised a style of bridge that was extremely economical. By keeping the bridges as small as possible, they are often described as being miniature. Costs were kept to a minimum, and the same theory was applied here. This is Ashi, an archetypal wayside halt with IWSR trains only stopping on request. There are very few stations on any line that actually have platforms that need mowing, but this is one of them. Also, you immediately notice that a great deal of clearing has gone on along the railway embankment, a testament to the extreme dedication of the IWSR's working parties that turn out in all weathers to keep the route maintained to their very high standards. All is quiet and peaceful here today. Ashy Halt is only accessible by footpath and even the station has passed into private hands. It's been tastefully renovated and still proudly bears the name Old Station House, with the original ashy name boards 
just visible through the garden fence. There are just two walkers using this service today to cover some of their journey under steam power, resting Shanks's pony for a while. In the summer months, it's quite a different story, with many people taking advantage of Ashy's unspoiled location in the heart of the countryside to take time out from their ramblings. The station was first opened in December 1875 and closed completely in February of 1966. For the Isle of Wight Steam Railway, it took a great deal of time and effort to open Ashy once again in May 1993, with track needing to be located and relayed. Once the guard has given the all clear, it's a straightforward run all the way into Haven Street. It's well worth allowing for a good long stop at Haven Street, which is basically the nerve centre of the Isle of Wight Steam Railway. The signal box is a busy place to be when trains are arriving and departing, and it's with a very well practised and experienced eye that this volunteer signalman pulls all the right levers. With the benefit of being able to actually peep behind the scenes with the camera, it's possible to take you to look at some of the many treasures that are not always on display. The engines and carriages in use on any given day are variable. After all, the locomotives are well over a hundred years old, and despite an efficient engineering team, you can never predict exactly what's going to happen. Out in the yard today, there's plenty of fascinating rolling stock. Some awaiting the tender loving care of restoration, with other examples in immaculate condition. A prime example of a job well done is Newport W11. Popularly known as a terrier, Newport is the most famous Stroudley Class A of them all. Also in pristine condition is 198 Royal Engineer, one of the famous Hunslet designed austerity class locomotives built for the army in 1953. This historic locomotive doesn't actually belong to the IWSR, but has been on loan here from the Royal Corps of Transport Museum Trust since 1992. Hidden away inside the engine shed are even more treasures, including another terrier, Freshwater W8, which has equally as fascinating a history as Newport. Built in 1877, 
This engine operated on the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway before being transferred to the new Lyme Regis branch in 1903. By 1913, the Isle of Wight Railway ceased to work the Freshwater, Yarmouth and Newport line and the FYN suddenly found itself in desperate need of locomotive power. So the then 734 was shipped to the Isle of Wight on hire from the LBSCR. She remained on the island receiving the name Freshwater in 1928 before returning to the mainland in 1949 and eventually being withdrawn from service in 1963. It took until 1979 for Freshwater's eventual return to the Isle of Wight and fully restored this much loved engine triumphantly returned to traffic on the 21st of June 1981. There are many flourishing preserved railways throughout Great Britain and all of them have different specialities that make them unique. In some instances the character is built upon the original purpose of the railway and a perfect example of this is the Dean Forest Railway in Gloucestershire where the region's coal mining and iron rich heritage sets the mood for what is becoming a remarkable piece of railway history. Equally of note is the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway in North Yorkshire, famous for character of a completely different sort. This line runs through the little country town of Haworth, where thousands of visitors from all over the world flock each year to see the parsonage home of the literary Bronte sisters. Picturesque and unspoiled, it was also the line used for shooting the feature film The Railway Children, now as much of a classic as the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway itself. So what is the real speciality of the Isle of Wight Steam Railway? As you've already seen and heard, Calbourne and the two island terriers, Newport and Freshwater, are absolutely unique. But many steam railways can boast equally spectacular rolling stock of great pertinence to their own particular lines. To find something that truly is the envy of all other preserved railways, you need to take a closer look at what the magnificent locomotives actually pull. The carriages which today's visitors are travelling in are really beautiful and there's always the opportunity for them to really live in style by upgrading their tickets to first class. It was one of those strange but much appreciated quirks of fate that started this society's collection of carriages and they've certainly made the most of every opportunity to improve and add to their stock since. At the very beginning, when steam transport came to an end on the Isle of Wight in 1966, it was a group of schoolboys that instigated the interest for the formation of the White Locomotive Society. As the name suggests, it was the rolling stock that held particular appeal and their aim was to buy Calbourne, which had been the last engine to undergo an overhaul at Ride Works in 1965. Their bid was successful and a preserved steam society was born. Also available were five bogey carriages at the princely sum of £85 each with a sixth to follow and as funds were available the deal was done. Once the fascination for authentic carriages had begun the society embarked on a policy through the 70s of acquiring grounded bodies of Isle of Wight carriages 
and when a quantity of redundant parcel vans were purchased from BR in the early 80s, it was possible to get everything back on the tracks. Today work is constantly ongoing and here you can see the painstaking effort that goes into restoration. Carriages in all imaginable states of disrepair have found refuge at the IWSR after use as sheds, garages, hen houses and holiday chalets. This photograph shows the condition that some carriages have arrived in. This particular one had been used as a bungalow at Gurnard Marsh and when the site was redeveloped the Isle of Wight Steam Railway was able to acquire it. Now completely restored, it has become part of the very important collection of Victorian carriages that the IWSR is renowned for. As there are Victorian carriages resting through this quieter time of the year, we've the perfect opportunity to take a closer look. By the time these carriages were built, rail travel had seen some improvements in creature comforts. In the early days of the railways, even a first-class passenger had to sit in a construction based loosely upon a horse box. In darkness, the only light was by means of a smelly oil lamp and there was no communication possible with the next carriage or even the guard. Alarm cords were only fitted after a murder had actually been committed in a railway compartment. Second class carriages usually had roofs but no enclosed sides and third class passengers often travelled in open trucks that not only lacked roofs but also seating. However uncomfortable this new form of transport might have been, it did little to deter the early travellers and railway mania quickly swept the length and breadth of Great Britain. There's a real feeling of nostalgia as you enter these carriages with polished woodwork and authentic upholstery helping to take visitors back in time. Even the smell is unique and for the volunteers who have put hours of work into restoration, the evident appreciation of the travellers on the line is reward enough. There is of course a distinct royal connection with the railways on the Isle of Wight and this lithograph of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert in the royal carriage of 1844 is of great interest when looking at the layout of this carriage. Although later, and nowhere near so grandly decorated, you can see the principle of closing off a small section at the end of the carriage. Here it's used as a first-class saloon, but it would appear to have been an ideal arrangement for members of the royal staff back in 1844, leaving a delightful sitting area for the Queen to entertain guests. Travelling around the Isle of Wight, it's well worth looking out for railway carriages still being used as sheds, beach huts and stores. However, the policy of the IWSR is to wherever possible acquire and return old carriages from the original island railways back into service. So don't be surprised if even the most dilapidated looking specimen finds its way back to this very special STEAM Society. As the day goes on, more visitors arrive to enjoy the delights of Haven Street. One treasure that's always attracted attention is this sympathetically restored fire engine. Belonging to one of the Society's members rather than the IWSR, Many years of devoted care have been lavished on this Bedford TK water tender that was first registered with the Shanklin Fire Service in 1966. Although restoration is constantly ongoing, this vehicle is still fully operational 
and as her owner is a serving Isle of Wight firefighter, in case of emergency, you couldn't ask for a better team. Time now to take a final look at Haven Street, as Calborn prepares to depart for the last stretch of our journey to Wootton. From this angle, it's certainly an impressive sight. Restoration work has been so successful that it's hard to tell which fixtures and fittings have been brought in and which are original. The water tower looks as if it stood here forever, but in fact in former times it was located at the northern end of the down platform at Newport Station. Haven Street today is a small rural village and would in no way justify a station of this size, but the fact that between 1886 and the 1920s the Haven Street gasworks stood virtually where the IWSR's works shed can now be seen explains the previous importance of this beautifully preserved location. One of the most noticeable elements that you'll see as you ride this line is the abundance of foliage and natural habitats, even at this late stage of the year, that covers the well-tended railway embankments. Because the IWSR runs a limited rather than a busy commuter service, there's plenty of opportunity for wildlife to flourish. Badgers have always lived along the line and their tell-tale sets are clearly visible, surprisingly close to the tracks, and for bird and butterfly spotters, the summer months are an absolute joy. This last part of our journey does see a slight change in the landscape, as there's an increased woodland scene, and for many walkers, the nearby Firestone Copse and Parkhurst Forest are popular destinations. As Calborn pulls into Wootton Station, the landscaped view gives every impression that this has always been the end of the line, providing a simple country terminus with a charming rural atmosphere. However, this has been a major work of restoration, as Wootton was one of the earlier stations on this line to close. Although the reason for closure was mainly due to the forces of nature, with a bank of constantly moving, water-laden clay opposite the platform requiring diligent monitoring, the closure of Wootton was without doubt preempted by the closure of Whippingham Station, the next stop along the line. So before taking a closer look at Wootton, it's well worth travelling by road to find the remains of Whippingham Station and discover why this long abandoned railway treasure is such an intrinsic part of the Isle of Wight's fascinating history. This picturesque footpath is where the tracks of the cows to ride line used to run and today it takes some considerable delving through the undergrowth to find any trace of the old platform. The station house is now in private hands and has been lovingly restored despite the fact that after the closure of the line at Whippingham, it fell into disrepair and was in a poor state for many years. Whippingham Station was first opened on the 20th of December 1875 for a very important purpose. It was to be the private station for the use of Queen Victoria and members of the Royal Household and their guests, en route to Osborne House, just two and a half miles away, towards the mouth of the Medina Valley. Prince Albert designed Osborne as a country retreat, and his admiration of Italian architecture is evident. 
the great lady described it as a place of one's own, quiet and retired. And she certainly came here to escape the pressures of royal life. It was the perfect holiday home, with the many royal children greatly enjoying their own Swiss chalet in grounds as a playhouse, which still stands to this day in the beautifully landscaped grounds. Queen Victoria's preference for the Isle of Wight did much to establish the island as a popular holiday destination, and there's a Victorian atmosphere much treasured in many resorts. A short detour into the village of Whippingham and a visit to the Church of St Mildred will reveal the most tangible examples of the royal family's influence in the area. Typical of the Victorian era, the church is a mixture of mock medieval and Victorian Gothic. There's been a church on this site since medieval times, and in 1804 it was rebuilt by the great architect John Nash, the man responsible for the remarkable onion domes of the Brighton Pavilion and the enlargement of Buckingham House into a palace. When St Mildred's was selected as the royal place of worship, being the closest church to Osborne House, Nash's handiwork was completely demolished. This may have been because of the architect's close association with Queen Victoria's uncle, King George IV, whose drinking, gambling and clandestine liaisons would most certainly not have amused his morally upstanding niece. Equally so, the church just may not have been grand enough, and some of the features of this replacement building are remarkable, if a little over ornate. The squat tower is adorned with five pinnacles, and a brief tour will reveal a number of royal tombs and memorials. This lovely iron cross marks the grave of Prince Louis of Battenberg and his wife, Princess Victoria of Hesse a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. They were actually parents of Earl Mountbatten of Burma and the grandparents of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, and as such might well have been buried with greater pomp and circumstance, but for royalty and commoner alike a more peaceful resting place would be hard to find. Opposite the church is a row of almshouses worthy of mention built on the orders of Queen Victoria in 1880 to provide accommodation for retired royal servants from the Osborne estate. After Queen Victoria's death, Osborne ceased to be a favoured royal residence. For her son, King Edward VII, the Isle of Wight was rather isolated for his more extravagant social tastes, and he gave Osborne to the nation as a memorial to his mother, and so it remains to this day. When royal visits were no longer a part of Whippingham life, the station was opened for use by the general public, but by 1953 it was closed on economic grounds, with Wooten also closed at the same time due to maintenance costs. Time then to return to Wooten and see the fine work the Isle of Wight Steam Railway has done to revitalise this station at the end of their line. Despite the fact that the booking office and signal box appear to have always been where they are today, it's very definitely not the case. The signal box started life with the Freshwater, Yarmouth and Newport Railway and was moved to Freshwater in 1927, where it remained until that station's closure in '53. After some years being used as a bus shelter, it was returned to its intended occupation here at Wooten in the early days of the preserved railway in 1987. The eight-lever frame which replaced the long-lost freshwater workings is part of that from the old Shanklin signal box. 
The booking office was carefully dismantled at its original location on Ride Pier and was rebuilt here at Wooten. Combine these elements with the fine collection of preserved wagons parked in the engineer's siding and you have an air of years gone by that epitomises the very essence of the Isle of Wight steam railway. As our journey today comes to an end, as Calborn runs around to return the delighted passengers back to Haven Street, a view of the future is as vital to the survival of this preserved steam railway as the living view of the past. Ever since the dawn of the railway age back in the 19th century, nothing has ever stood still for long, and as this programme has shown, the IWSR is no exception. From the fulfilment of a schoolboy's dream to preserve Calborn, a very successful railway company has evolved for visitors from all over the world to enjoy. It's often been said that in the early days of railway development on the Isle of Wight, the heart rather than the head ruled strategic planning. But this can never be said at the IWSR. There are an abundance of devoted members volunteering their services to breathe life into this wonderful railway. However, an experienced business team has also been brought in to oversee the management of these unique resources. Although perhaps unpalatable at first, a constructively critical eye was cast over the operation and a business strategy put into place that would ensure the continued asset of a steam railway on the Isle of Wight. The future is bright and at present the IWSR is fundraising for a new carriage and wagon workshop which will allow them to continue their first-class restoration and maintenance of rolling stock. Also looking long-term, an extension of the line into Ride St John's would be the stuff of dreams. Not only would Smallbrook Junction, which lacks vehicular access, be relieved of responsibility as the end of the line, but also a central location in the popular seaside holiday town of Ryde with plenty of parking and other conveniences would make the Isle of Wight steam railway an even greater attraction. It may seem an ambition that is a long way from even being attempted, but you can never tell. With the kind of hard work and dedication that we've seen today, anything's possible. But for the time being, let's settle for watching Calborn and her coaches disappear off into the distance, last stop Haven Street at the end of this truly remarkable day, experiencing the power of steam on the Isle of Wight. <laughs>